So today is Friday, April 20th, and um, we're, we have our student speakers. So if our first student speaker, Susie, if you want to come on up. And then this is locked, so you can just throw it in your back pocket or your front pocket. And then you can just clip this on your t-shirt. It's already on? Yep, it's already, everything's already on. We're already recording. There you go. Me in 1998 and the way I lived just about all my adult life up until the age of 38. And now I am not ashamed to say I am 42 years old, old enough to be most of these people in this classroom's mother. So, <laughs> this, is, this uh, topic is very, very important to me, obviously. Obvious reasons. I'm very passionate about it. Um, when I transformed, I became more and more interested in what was going on in my body. Um, not only the anatomy changes <coughs> I went through, but the physiological changes. Um, it is an increasing concern in America as it continues to grow due to bad eating habits um, paired with the lack of physical activity as well as uh, disease um, because those two things are not uh, the only reason why be people become obese. Um, it's important for us to understand what's truly effective and safe for each individual because there is no cookie cutter uh, plan for weight loss. Um, billions of dollars are spent on convenience foods um, due to people not having enough time to uh, cook up meals or not wanting to. In my case, it was always not wanting to take the time. Um, in turn, that's about the same amount people um, spend in products uh, that promote gimmicks um, for weight loss, um, herbal supplements, um, you know, things that promise energy that do not have calories, uh, you know, uh, for example. And as fitness pro uh, professionals, we have to debunk those daily um, to provide true solutions. Um, to this epidemic through safe and effective physical activity and nutrition education. Um, obese individuals are a special population, so that means we're going to have to keep in mind the, the cardiovascular disease risks um, associated. Um, it's not, as I said before, always a result of inactivity and gluttony. It's also a result of genetics and hormonal imbalances. Um, obesity, as we, we have learned here in this class, is a condition in having too high of a body fat percentage for total weight. For men, the allowance is um, no more than 25% body fat, and um, as we have also learned commonly, they are shaped android or apple shaped. Um, women have a higher allowance, 35% body fat, and that allowance is due to the fact that they carry it lower and it's mostly uh, subcontaneous. Um, complications associated with obesity <coughs> include coronary heart disease, hypertension, stroke, type 2 diabetes, cancer, which is commonly endometrial, breast and colon, liver and gallbladder disease, osteoarthritis, sleep apnea, and respiratory problems. And if you ask me how I escaped most of these, it's a miracle. And here we have our five classes. And uh, lately we have been drilled with this in our PFT course. So we have our underweight, anything under 18.5 BMI. Um, normal, 18.5 to 24.9. And then you go to overweight, 25. The cutoff is 29.9. We have three classes of obesity, 30 to 34.9 is the first class. Second class is 35 to 39.9. And anything over 40 is considered third class extreme obesity, and that is where I was. Obesity is determined, as we have learned in this class, um, BMI, 
But as we also know, BMI doesn't give us the whole story, especially in athletes. So they use this pri uh, primarily in obese patients. Um, it's body weight in kilograms divided by height squared meters. Um, we also use skinfold calipers, the DEXA scan, low dose x-ray that measures only subcutaneous fat, the bioimpedance analysis, small electrical charge is impeded by fatty tissue, and that is where we get our measurement from for fat, and computed tomography, CT scan. This is a transverse section of the body image so that both subcutaneous and visceral fat can be seen. And here you can see from 1960 to 2008 just how much obesity, the prevalence of obesity has climbed. And I believe the, um, if I recall correctly, um, the red is, it's the red, the men, the in general, the, the red is females. Okay, the red is females, yeah. Females, but um, it doesn't have the key on the Well, one of those general, slides had the key, and I didn't include uh, that, so. Have, in general, the red is But as you can see, it's, it's, it's very <coughs> close. I mean, both, both male and female <coughs> uh, climbed quite significantly. And um, a lot of that has to do with, of course, um, being less active and then um, being in a positive energy balance. And um, as you can see also the relation to um, how uh, mortality um, correlates with your body mass index as it raises, um, it increases sharply, um, especially as you get into your higher classes of obesity, your uh, risk of mortality uh, increases quite sharply. Uh, as I said a few times before, um, this can be caused by an inactive lifestyle paired with bad dietary habits, um, but it also can be uh, something um, as simple as a dysfunction of your bodily systems. It is preventable, it is true, and treatable with lifestyle change uh, by adding regular physical activity particularly resistance training. They found, um, according to the book, uh, resistance training um, is, more, um, is more beneficial for uh, changes in body composition. Um, but you can, of course, um, include cardiovascular training as well for even better improvement. Um, better eating habits. Uh, many associated diseases will either be under control or completely wiped out um, from this change. Um, that would be from scaling down portion sizes and then also um, taking out the bad, putting in the good, you know, uh, getting rid of your refined and putting in your whole grains. Simple as that. Learning how to substitute. Um, whether as personal trainers or physical education teachers, it is up to us to become educated on how to become part of this solution. Tony had asked in our, um, in our paper what we thought, or at least what I thought, was the best indicator of overall health. And I came to the conclusion that either the absence of disease and a healthy body weight or the control of diseases that cannot be cured but are treatable is one indicator. And then all around wellness that encompasses mental, emotional, and physical health. And although that is a huge challenge, um, much can be overcome and it is a lifetime process. She also asked what I thought the best indicator of athletic success. And it's not all about winning. It's all about dedication, motivation, mental toughness, willing to step out of comfort zone to become better at a sport or better in your lifestyle, <coughs> um, integrity, and good sportsmanship. If you don't have any of those, might as well not call yourself a good athlete. Okay, clicker question. <coughs> Thank you.
started. Oh, okay. Well, I was waiting for everybody to get their oh, clickers out. All right. Okay. Uh, women have an allowance for higher body Our fat percentage because. <laughs> <laughs> How many we have here today? The half would be me. <laughs> That's kind of cute. <laughs> I've been told that. Yeah, we got ten. We're good. Okay, yeah. we good? Yeah. Okay. And one of them's me. I know. That's horrible. Wow, good job, class. Oops. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Can we go back to the uh, mortality graph? Yes, we can. Um, the, um, I don't know if I was. I didn't feel like a whole lot of time. Oh. And then, I thought there was like a shortcut. Oh, you can just hit a back arrow as well. Oh, a back arrow. I was doing shift back. <clears throat> yes, here we um, go. It shows it. Do you know why it would dip down like that? Why it would dip down. Yeah, for the work. Like, because it starts. Is that for like. I feel like you're underweight right there. Right and then at optimal. Yeah. I, think, I think that is probably speaking of optimal, is it? Or? I can explain the graph thing. I know every single person who's presented, I've jumped up and, and explained their graph. So why stop now? I mean, I, I can definitely explain. I can definitely explain why it sharply increases. I mean, that that to me to me that's common sense. I mean, I looked in the book and. Um, I, I did read. I read, I read no, the I chapter. I think the book really explains this one. So I can, yeah, I so. can jump in and explain sure. this one if you want. What's the mortality ratio? Um, mortality ratio is like as a percent of um, if you were to be like the healthiest. How do I explain that? Hmm? Ignore that. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you ignore that right now. What we're going to do is look right here about um, your risk, it's more or less your risk of dying, but I don't know exactly how they calculate mortality <laughs> ratio. And so your risk of dying is going to be actually higher with someone who has a really low BMI when you're talking about around 17. And one of the reasons there is because of the fact that if they get a really bad flu, like extremely bad pneumonia, cancer, other types of major illnesses, their immunity would be compromised. Right. And so they don't have <laughs> reserves in order to help with their immune system function. Um, so that's something where if you have really low BMI, then that is one of the, the presumed reasons that they look at. If you look at the cause of death in those individuals, oftentimes that's what it is. Um, other things that we see with these individuals, oftentimes their BMI is low because they're already ill, and so they've been fighting illness for a long time. And so if you look at someone who's had chronic long-term illnesses, depending on what the illness is, it takes a lot of energy to fight some of those illnesses, and so they might have a perpetually lower BMI as well. So if you look, we in this class have not talked about why it will be mine, but if you have a healthy individual who's not suffering from a chronic illness and doesn't fall prey to um, something like, again, the flu, cancer, or other sorts of things, they have a lower incidence of heart disease and diabetes. So you might go, my goodness, I, I know the lower the BMI, the lower the incidence of heart disease and diabetes. This doesn't take, in this graph takes into account all reasons for death rather than just focusing on the ones that we're most interested in this class. Well, and I think too, with like the majority of your people who are very low BMI, it's not like we're talking about all Olympic athletes no, here or things like no, that. No, not at all. all. In fact, you look at athletes who generally fall somewhere right around here a lot of times, or possibly even higher as far as BMI is concerned if you have a male, because BMI does not take into account body fat percentage, unfortunately. So, um, any other questions for Susie? Feel free. <laughs> I'm an open book. Okay. okay, I want to know how long it took you to go from that first picture to to now. To, well, to the weight that you. Well, this you know, first this started four months. years ago, 2008, so okay. June of 14th. I'll give a I'll be quick because I know other people have to present, but um, something within me snapped. I didn't want to live like that anymore. I did what I knew I could do, and I started walking. Everything was natural, no surgeries. 
Um, it took me, and I know that people in this field would be like, you what? You lost it in how long? That is not right. And it wasn't uh, because of my doctor. I was under physician um, supervision. However, I had not been seeing my doctor as I was being trained. My trainer erroneously gave me uh, a calorie count that was, it was, um, for what I was doing, it was starving myself. Uh, but had I not been as active, it would have been as bad. He had me on 1,500 calories, and we were doing a lot of uh, metabolic activities. Uh, a lot of times he'd have me do a lot of plyometrics, and at that time, that for me was a high intensity. Um, but, so, we were doing a lot. I was burning a lot of calories. I was doing also a lot of cardio on top of that. Um, it took me a year, uh, just under a year, about 14 days under a year to take off 200 pounds. And this is without surgery. This is, this is not necessarily starving myself, uh, depriving myself, but as far as the activity levels that I was doing, I was burning, I was exceeding way much. So it was kind of going into my muscle as well. So as I was losing fat, I was also losing a great amount of muscle. So, but you know what? If I had to do it all over again, I'd do it again because to go, to be like that picture that you saw before, I'd never go back to that. I'd go back to skin, loose skin and bones before I'd ever go back to that. And not only because it's, you know, the way people looked at me, it's because inside I felt really, really bad because I had no ability to move. And that's why I'm in this field because it excites me to be able to go from that, to be able to be almost as resigned to being in a scooter or a wheelchair and to be able to, I mean, not be an elite athlete, but I'm able to do things I was never able to do before I became obese. And so I'm gonna leave you with this one last thing that I'm not speaking to any one person in this, in this classroom, but I have seen this in the fitness field, in this town, in this area, in this college, where people are in the fitness field but they're not very sensitive towards people who are obese. You saw that we, we are in an epidemic, it's growing. And if we're in this field, and, and if we're having an attitude towards people who are morbidly obese or who have a weird body image, then we don't belong in this field. That's, that's my opinion. But that's, that's how I strongly feel because, because uh, as fitness professionals, we have to be very, very sensitive to people no matter how they look, whether they look bulky, or if they, they're morbidly obese, or if they're skinny, or whatever. So we have to keep that in consideration. So thank you for allowing me to present on this.